Word of Mouth is an adult story time presented by the Juliet Hampton Morgan Memorial Library. My name is Amy Campbell, and today I'll be reading The Painter of Trees by Suzanne Palmer and The Great Silence by Ted Xiong. If you enjoy today's program, we meet every first and third Thursday in the Global Classroom at 1210. This program is recorded live and will be available to enjoy again on our Facebook and YouTube pages. As a reminder, some stories contain adult language and content. It is recommended you revert, review stories before allowing younger audiences to listen. I go down to the gate, swipe my security pass, and step through the 10 meter tall still opening doors into the last of the wild lands. I remove my boots at the threshold and set them on a rack for that purpose, then carefully wash my feet from the basin of rainwater, still chill from the night before. When the doors have closed and sealed again, I remove my clothes. There is no one on this side of the wall to see who would take either advantage or offense at my nakedness. I wash my body from the same basin, shivering from the shock of the cold, before I remove the plain linen cloth from its hook above the rack and wrap, my, wrap it around myself. And then I walk down the path to find the painter of trees. The path curves over a small slope and then down a kilometer or so to the glade at the edge of a forest. The vegetation changes around me as I walk from the familiar sharp bladed grasses that have crept over the wall and seated themselves along its perimeter to the tiny delicate frills of blue green of the grass that first grew here, now in forced retreat. I know how soft they would be under my bare feet, how they would tickle, but also how easily they will crush and die. And though I know I will surely give into temptation one last time before they are gone forever, this time I keep to the stones. The trees here are outwardly very similar to the trees of home, except for their smooth exteriors and symmetrical branching. Their leaves are wide, gold green, open cones grouped in threes at the end of each stem which catch and hold rain for a long while after a storm. Cut a tree open though, and you find neither rings nor wood at all, but hexagonal cells all tucked neatly together, larger the closer to the center they are. Each one is capable, if broken free, of starting a new tree by itself, but together they each serve different functions observed to change over time as both external conditions and each cell's internal position in the whole changes. Mathematically, structurally, the trees are beautiful as they are naturally. Among them, there are flashes of bright color, vibrant pigments carefully etched into shallow scratches in the trunks, forming intricate hypnotic patterns, no two the same, none less compelling than the others. There have been days I have spent long hours staring at them or at our archived 3D images, and always there is that sense that some vast understanding of the meaning of being is just there in the lines, waiting for me to finally understand. From here, I can see signs the trees are dying. The small valley has a river that winds through it, and I cross a bridge made of carefully placed stones to the far side. I can see the large stickball nests up in the canopy above, fewer with each visit, and I can smell smoke. I find Ski tending to the fire as one of the nest falls, carefully extricated from its perch in the trees above and set upon stones, crackles and hisses in flame. Ski sees me and turns towards me. The Octi don't have heads, per se with all the functions we think of as specific to heads integrated in with the rest of their singular horizontal lump of a body, the same color as the leaves above. It stands atop nine legs. It lost three in an accident, it told me once, that are fine, graceful arcs that end in three pieces that can come together as a sharp, dangerous point or open to function like fingers. I sit on the ground, I level with it. After a while, it speaks, a complex series of whistles, clicks, and trills that my implant decodes for me. I'm sorry that Sai died, I say, and the implant, moment later, moments later, returns that in Ski's own language. Sai ate the dew grasses and became sick, Ski tells me. 
so I was afraid we would starve when the old grasses are gone with your wall between us and other meadows. There are no other meadows, though. That is why there is a wall. It was carefully placed so that you can't see it from here, in the heart of the forest valley. But that was before we knew the animals here were intelligent tree dwellers and could likely see from the canopy. But still, they cannot see over it, which is for the best. Ski swivels its body again back and forth for a few long minutes. It is thinking. Do your people eat the new grasses? It asked at last. No, I say because we do not. Then why did you bring them? It is part of our native ecosystem, I explain. Even the soil and the air do not taste right any longer, Ski says, and it picks up a stick with its tiny finger blades and pokes the fire. In the silence, I look around the glade. Where are the others? Desperate, Ski says. They have gone to look for hope. There's no response to give to that. Will you paint size tree? I ask instead. When her nest is cold ash and I can mix it with the colors, Ski says, only then will I paint. I am almost out of warm sky midday blue, which we traveled to meadow by the five hills to obtain. I am too old to go and only Sai also knew the way unless you also could go? I can't, I say, because it is not there, but also because even if it was, it is not something the council would accept. There is no way forward except forward. They would admonish me, no path to success without steadiness of thought, purpose, and action. The burning nest has collapsed down into itself, its once intricate woven structure, now a chaos of ember and ash. It does not matter. Ski says at last. There are only the three others and myself left now, and there will be no one to paint for the last of us that goes. The Ofti pokes the fire a few more times, then lays its stick carefully aside. Tomorrow, it says. May I come watch? I cannot stop you, Ski says. If you could, would you? Yes, but it is too late now. You are strange, squishy people, and you move as if you are always in the act of falling. But instead, it is everyone around you who falls and does not rise again, Ski says. And so it will also be with us. Yes, I answer in turn. It is a good summation of who we are and what we do. We are teeth on a cog, always moving forward and doing our part until we fall away and the next tooth takes up our work in turn. I get up from the ground, my legs stiff and stretch. Tomorrow then. I make the walk back to the gate without looking back, but my thoughts drag on me. The council members wait for the, bid, for the beginning chime and all take their seats around the table with price, precise synchronicity so that no one is ahead and no one is behind. The table is circular and is inlaid with a stylized copper cog design so that each member is reminded of that the way forward for each of them is with the others. This is how steadiness of purpose is maintained. And hatred, Josella thinks, as each face opposite perfectly reflects the righteous moral bankruptcy of their own. I propose with some urgency that we take whatever steps are necessary to preserve the remaining Ofti population and environs before it is lost forever. We already have extensive samples, Tassau says to her left. He is the biological archivist, and his expression suggests he has found a personal criticism in her words. Forgive me, your collection is unassailable in its diligence and scope. I was speaking in regards to the still living population, Josella interrupts. It is already too late, Modus speaks from directly across the table. There is no leader among them by consensus, but Modus, always rigid, always perfect in his adherence to the letter of their laws, leads them anyway. There are only four left. They no longer have sufficient genetic diversity to survive, even if we did find some way to insulate them from pl the planetary terraforming changes. 
With Tassau's collection, we could bolster their gene pool, Josella says. To what end? A great expenditure of effort and resources for something that gives us nothing in return? Your proposal is backwards thinking, Moda says. Not for the Ofti, Josella counters. They have a unique culture and language that should not be discarded so hastily. I know it has been a long time since any of you have spent time among them, but the Ofti have no future. They are already gone, but for a few final moments, Modus interrupts. Does anyone here second Gisela's proposal that we abandon our guiding principles for this lost cause? Many should, but none will or do. Tassau does not meet Gisela's eyes. And why should he, she thinks bitterly, when he has what is required to save already? His silence is a betrayal of both her and himself. The matter is settled then, Modus declares. Forward. Forward, some portion of the council responds, some with enthusiasm, some less so. Tassau is silent with Josella, but it is too late, too small a gesture in the face of his earlier cowardice, and she will not forgive him this day. Now there is a necessary discussion of high-speed rail lines, anticipated crop yields in the newly reformed soil, and planning for the next wave of colonists. They cannot linger for one member's wasteful, wasted regret. There is smoke rising from the glade again. I try not to hurry down the path. I remind myself that I am an, uh, that I am an observer here, nothing more. But if my steps are quicker than usual, who would be there to accuse me? No one else comes here. Ski is hopping back and forth unsteadily, whether because of its missing legs or its great agitation beside a large roaring bonfire. It does not have its tending stick, and the flames spark and flare and crackle with uncontrolled abandon. Dimly within the bright fire, I can make out three shapes, three nest balls. What happened? I ask. It takes several minutes for my translator to make sense of Ski's distress whistles, but at last it speaks. The others walked the circumference of the wall back to where they started and found no cause for hope. They have returned home and burned themselves. I tried to stop them, but I could not. I see now its awkwardness of movement is because many of its remaining legs are burned. I do not know what to do. Sesh, Aosa, Eason. That was their names, Ski says. Aosa and Eason were children of my children. They should be here with their long lives ahead to remember my last days, and not this. I am sorry, I say. Are you? Ski asks. The fires still rage, and some of the native grass beside the stones has caught, but the ofti either does not notice or ignores this. Does it matter which? I don't know, I say. Through the wavering heat and smoke, I can see that Ski has started already to paint Sai's tree, no doubt wanting to get it done before I could arrive and be an unwelcome witness. It must have been doing that when the others returned to end their lives, as there are leaves on the ground around the base of the trunk, their cones filled with different colors, and I can see the silvery lines of etching up the tree trunk that had not yet been filled. The effect is still mesmerizing, even so unfinished, and I feel momentarily lost in it again. Then the realization strikes me. With its legs burned, Ski will not be able to finish the painting, will not take me that one step closer to elusive understanding, and at that my heart catches in my throat, and I feel now the loss that Josella had warned of us, like a million cuts in my skin. Too late, too late, too late. Can I help you paint, I ask. It is the wrong thing to say. Go, Ski cries. These are not here for you, for your eyes or alien thoughts. These are our memories, made in love of one another, a declaration for future generations. And you have destroyed us. Leave now and do not return. I stand there for a while. Ski watches the fires burn and does not move to tend it nor to throw itself upon it. 
The thought that Ski might burn the grove down once I'm gone keeps me there longer. Until at last, the burning nests have been consumed and the grass fire has died out. Leaving a three meter blackened, jagged scar on the land, an indelible fracture that will never grow back. Ski makes a sound that the translation implant cannot work with, perhaps because it is not a word, just inarticulate grief. I should not have come, should not have stayed this long. These conversations with Ski have not been forward thinking, and I know this and knew better, but yet I came. It is a defect in my commitment to my own people that I let strangeness and novelty tempt me. I am sorry, I say again, and this time I leave. I stay on the path even though my feet want to walk upon the native grasses one last time because I am certain I will not come again. At the gate, I leave my linen shift, bathe again with the lukewarm water, and then when the sun and meager breeze has left my skin chill and mostly dry, I dress and gather my things and put my real life back on. The gates open, and despite a life of training and my commitment to our ways and philosophies, this time, I look back. Ski is coming up the path toward me. It is moving with difficulty and obvious pain, made the worse by the urgency with which it is trying to catch up to me. I should not have looked back, should now turn and step through the gate and close the door for this last time, but I cannot. Ski stops a few meters from me and almost collapses before it gathers its strength to stand tall again. Show me, it says. What? I ask. I do not understand. Show me what is now outside this wall, where once my children played and ran and climbed. Show me what you have done with my world, what you have that is so much better than us. On my side of the wall, it is city under construction, a thousand identical structures for 10,000 people, all looking only forward in the direction we, the council, point. There is no art, no individual movement away from the whole, nothing rare to puzzle over. It is an existence I am proud of and proud of my part in, but it is only for us and I do not want to explain or justify any of it, nor have to face the council and explain myself. No, I say. Could you stop me? Ski asks. Yes, I say. Would you? If you could, yes, I say again. Then stop me, Ski says, and it steps around me and heads toward the gates. I take the small gun from my bag. All council members carry one for protection, for moments of dispensing justice, and although I have never used it except in training, it is solid and comfortable in my hand, and with it, I kill Ski. It crumbles and becomes still, and in the removal of its animation, it becomes just a thing, a leftover bit of debris from this world that has been repurposed. Now I can turn my back and proceed through the gates and return to this city of ours and be whole and compliant in forward thinking again. Josella speaks barely a moment after the council time has rung and everyone has settled in their seats. The Ofti are extinct, she says. Three of the remaining population appear to have self-immolated, and the last was found dead at the exterior gates with significant burns. I recommend a necropsy to determine the cause. Surely it must have succumbed to the burns, Modus says. There may be things we can learn. Counselor Tassel, do we have any incomplete biological or behavioral data that could be, still be obtained from this specimen if retrieved, Modus asks. Tassau looks miserable. His eyes are puffy as if he has been crying, though none would ask and none would admit to such a thing in his place. Tears only ever serve the past. No, he says, his voice barely a whisper. Then he speaks again louder and more firmly. <clears throat> no. Then what would you propose we learn from such a procedure, Counselor Josella? Its death is sooner than we would have anticipated, but it was also inevitable, and its cause does, not, does seem self-evident. I want to know why it crawled all that way after being burned to die at our gate, 
Josella wants to say. But Modus is right, for all she hates it. The Ofti was old and injured. There is no purpose now, nothing to be gained. And whatever the Ofti wanted in its last moments was already lost to them. I feel it would be a completeness of record, she says instead. So noted, Modus says. Does anyone second that proposal? There are hesitations, shared looks, mutual avoidance, but in the end, predictably, no one does. There is the matter of the grove and its surrounding lands, Avell brings up from Josella's right. We had spoken about keeping it as is, as an educational historical attraction. If we wish to do so, we should act now before the remaining grass and trees deteriorate further. It would only be a matter of a week or two of work to encase everything individually so they are preserved in their current state. It is a waste of space that could be used for something productive, Banad speaks up. I would vote for preservation, Josella says, as would I, Tassau adds. Modus turns to Avell. I propose you bring the full details of a preservation project to our next meeting so we may view and assess its merits and costs objectively. Banad, if you have an alternate proposal, then likewise, we need all the relevant specifics and an objective justification for why it is a better use of the space. Does anyone second me? Tassau nods and swallows. I do, he says. Good. Forward, Modus says. And then they adjourn. The grove looks the same as the last time I was here, but it feels empty. It has not rained here in weeks. The moisture-laden clouds were needed elsewhere with our fledgling farms. So the ash and small remains of the three burned nests have not washed away. I walk around them to where Ski had set up his leaves of paint, and I sit in front of them. And I look at the trees, dozens and dozens of them. Here in the forest behind, many freshly painted, many more marking the fading record of thousands of generations gone. I still do not comprehend my own attraction, how this uncivilized, unrefined, unforward art can feel so alive, so in the moment, so connecting, so utterly alien. Perhaps it is the simplest act of remembering the dead, when I come from a people where to mourn, to grieve, to remember those who are no longer part of the future is the most foolish, backward thinking of all. Yet. It is the painted trees that keep drawing me here, and they are still here. Ski was ultimately an obstacle to my full and peaceful enjoyment of them. Surely, though, none of this would exist without the Ofti. Now it is ours, mine. There is pride and relief as I think this, and also a deep shame that feels wrapped around the core of my being. Guilt is a backwards emotion, and I disavow that shame, even if it will not leave me be. Instead, I find that the more I study them, the more the designs on the trees seem to be mocking me, forever locked away from my comprehension. Ski must have followed me, made me kill it, because it knew that by doing so, it would steal this from me. The worst is the half-finished memorial on Sai's tree. I should have stayed here that day and forced Ski back to work, forced it to finish this last tree so that I could have the whole now and walk away satisfied that I missed and lost nothing. But it is broken, like Ski is broken, and it is Ski's doing that both should be so. Forward, then. I did not change my clothes nor leave my things at the gate. There is no fear of bringing microorganisms with me that could damage what is already functionally administratively dead. From my bag, I take out blue paint that I had made in one of our autofab units. Holding it now against the blue in Ski's leaf, I see mine is darker, not the right shade at all. But it will be close enough. Blue is blue. I use my fingers and I rub it on Sai's tree, press it into the scratches Ski left with my fingertips. Until breathing heavily from the exertion, I stand back again to admire my own accomplishment. It is a mess, an inarticulate, artless smear. I take several deep breaths, and then I go back in, and I try again, using my fingernails instead of fingertips, trying to work with the flow of the lines, trying to find how it is supposed to go. I chip my nails, and several bleed before I give up. 
recap my jar of paint, and stand back to see what I have just made worse. Do not understand how I, I, could fail at this frivolous thing that some dead animal moldering in the grass up the hill could comprehend and encompass. I had thought, in my arrogance, in my superior thinking, that after my practice on size tree, I would for my last act here paint skis tree, and no one would ever know it was me. And thus I would be preserved, and every one of my people who looked here for generations would remember me, even if they did not know that they did so. Then I would not just be one undifferentiated tooth on a cog gear, turning forward, resisting backward with all the others, but a fixed point. I feel in that instant that all I have accomplished is to immortalize my own foolishness, to forever diminish everything that I have ever reliably and competently accomplished under a shadow of mockery. Furious at myself, at Ski for forcing my hand, at this entire plant, I throw down my jar of paint. I had sealed it, but it hits one of the rocks just right, just wrong, and shatters, and paint droplets fly every, everywhere. Not just onto the disaster I've made of size tree, but onto others nearby. No! I cry out loud, and I sink to my knees in the dying grasses, and am consumed by my own rage and horror. Josella stands, trying not to shift impatiently from foot to foot, waiting for the rest of the council to arrive. She is early, but not by much. Bernard was already here, clutching his report pad to his chest as if to protect his ambitions from her judging eyes. She has prepared her own argument to back up Avell's, in case he does not make a compelling enough case on his own against Bernard. So much has already been lost she thinks, but if I can save the tiny fraction left, I will. One by one, others arrive, but other than the sounds of their movement, the chamber remains silent. It is a recognition, she likes to think, of the weighty day ahead of them. Right at the hour bell, the doors slide open again, and Modus comes in, moving more quickly than his usual ponderous and insufferably formal gait, and there's something in his expression she has never seen before. As she tries to untangle and define what it is, she is distracted by something else. His hands are inexplicably stained blue. Modus, she begins to ask, and he visibly flinches at the sound of his own name. Behind him, Tassau, last of the council to arrive, runs into the chamber. He is heaving for breath, his face red with sweat, and something more, something the opposite of, the, of Modus's. The Opti-Grove, he shouts. It's on fire. Arson, the whole forest has gone up. Everyone turns just as the council chime sounds, and the acrid smell of smoke drifts in through the doors behind Tassau, a ghost with the swagger of an uninvited guest and accusations of murder on its breath, and it settles itself around a shivering modus like a linen shroud. This is the great silence that Ted Xiang the humans use Arecibo to look for extraterrestrial intelligence. Their desire to make a connection is so strong that they've created an ear capable of hearing across the universe. But I and my fellow parrots are right here. Why aren't they interested in listening to our voices? We're a non-human species capable of communicating with them. Aren't we exactly what humans are looking for? The universe is so vast that intelligent life must surely have arisen many times. The universe is also so old that even one technological species would have had time to expand and fill the galaxy. Yet there is no sign of life anywhere except on Earth. Humans call this the Fermi paradox. One proposed solution to the Fermi paradox is that intelligent species actively try to conceal their presence to avoid being targeted by hostile invaders. Speaking as a member of a species that has been driven nearly to extinction by humans, I can attest that this is a wise strategy. It makes sense to remain quiet and avoid attracting attention. The Fermi pod paradox is sometimes known as the great silence. The universe ought to be a cacophony of voices, but instead, it's disconcertingly quiet. Some humans theorize that intelligent species go extinct before they can expand into outer space. 
if they're correct, then the hush of the night sky is the silence of a graveyard. Hundreds of years ago, my kind was so plentiful that the Rio Abajo forest sound resounded with our voices. Now we're almost gone. Soon this rainforest may be as silent as the rest of the universe. There was an African gray parrot named Alex. He was famous for his cognitive abilities, famous among, among humans, that is. A human researcher named Irene Pepperberg spent 30 years studying Alex. She found that not only did Alex know the words for shapes and colors, he actually understood the concepts of shape and color. Many scientists were skeptical that a bird could grasp abstract concepts. Humans like to think they're unique. But eventually, Pepperberg convinced them that Alex wasn't just repeating words, that he understood what he was saying. Out of all of my cousins, Alex was the one who came closest to being taken seriously as a communication partner by humans. Alex died suddenly when he was still relatively young. The evening before he died, Alex said to Pepperberg, you be good, I love you. If humans are looking for a connection with a non-human intelligence, what more can they ask for than that? Every parrot has a unique call that it uses to identify itself. Biologists refer to this as the parrot's contact call. In 1974, Astronomers used Arecibo to broadcast a message into outer space intended to demonstrate human intelligence. That was humanity's contact call. In the wild, parrots address each other by name. One bird imitates another's contact call to get the other bird's attention. If humans ever detect the Arecibo message being sent back to Earth, they will know someone is trying to get their attention. Parrots are vocal learners. We can learn to make new sounds after we've heard them. It's an ability that few animals possess. A dog may understand dozens of commands, but it will never do anything but bark. Humans are vocal learners too. We have that in common. So humans and parrots share a special relationship with sound. We don't simply cry out, we pronounce, we enunciate. Perhaps that's why humans built Arecibo the way they did. A receiver doesn't have to be a transmitter, transmitter, but Arecibo is both. It's an ear for listening and a mouth for speaking. Humans have lived alongside parrots for thousands of years, and only recently have they considered the possibility that we might be intelligent. I suppose I can't blame them. We parents, we parrots used to think humans weren't very bright. It's hard to make sense of behavior that's so different from your own. But parrots are more similar to humans than any extraterrestrial species will be. And humans can observe us up close. They can look us in the eye. How do they expect to recognize an alien intelligence if all they can do is eavesdrop from a hundred light years away? It's no coincidence that aspiration means both hope and the act of breathing. When we speak, we use the breath in our lungs to give our thoughts a physical form. The sounds we make are simultaneously our intentions and our life force. I speak, therefore I am. Vocal learners, like parrots and humans, are perhaps the only ones who fully comprehend the truth of this. There is a pleasure that comes with shaping sounds with your mouth. It's so primal and visceral that throughout their history, humans have considered the activity a pathway to the divine. Pythagorean mystics believed that vowels represented the music of the spheres and chanted to draw power from them. Pentecostal Christians believe that when they speak in tongues, they're speaking the languages used by angels in heaven. Brahmin Hindus believe that by reciting mantras, they're strengthening the building blocks of reality. Only a species of vocal learners would ascribe such importance to the sound in their mythologies. We parrots can appreciate that. According to Hindu mythology, the universe was created with a sound om. It's a syllable that contains within it everything that ever was and everything that will be. When the Arecibo telescope is pointed at the space between stars, it hears a faint hum. 
Astronomers call that the cosmic microwave background. It's the residual radiation of the Big Bang, the explosion that created the universe 14 billion years ago. But you can also think of it as a barely audible reverberation of that original OM. That syllable was so resonant that the night sky will keep vibrating for as long as the universe exists. When Arecibo is not listening to anything else, it hears the voice of creation. We Puerto Rican parrots have our own myths. They're simpler than human mythology, but I think humans would take pleasure from them. Alas, our myths are being lost as my species dies out. I doubt the humans will have deciphered our language before our, we are gone. So the extinction of my species doesn't just mean the loss of a group of birds. It's also the disappearance of our language, our rituals, our traditions. It's the silencing of our voice. Human activity has brought my kind to the brink of extinction, but I don't blame them for it. They didn't do it maliciously. They just weren't paying attention. And humans create such beautiful myths. What imaginations they have. Perhaps that's why their aspirations are so immense. Look at Arecibo. Any species that can build such a thing must have greatness within it. My species probably won't be here for much longer. It's likely that we'll die before our time and join the great silence. But before we go, We are sending a message to humanity. We just hope the telescope at Arecibo will enable them to hear it. The message is this. You'll be good. I love you.